This is The Journey of Little Charlie, chapters uh, by Christopher Paul Curtis, uh, the chapter 16, The Kidnapping of Sylvanus Demarest. Another way them Canadians is different than normal folk is that they found two trees, one next to the other, and a patch of grass and some water nearby. They turn around and call the whole thing a park. In South Carolina, if there's some nice smooth water like this big pond, folks would just uh, willy-nilly pull off their shoes off and dip their foots in the water, then go home or wet a line and pull some fish out. Not in Canada. Them Canadians are keen on putting benches up and throwing pathways down so as you could sit and keep an eye on the water and the ducks and the gooses. They also put up lots of signs that you didn't even know have to didn't even have to know how to read to know what they were saying. They had pictures showing you what you wasn't supposed to do. There was one sign that showed a man holding up a fish on a line with a big X cutting him in parts. Same, same with the sign showing someone tossing rocks underhand at a bunch of birds in the water with the same X dividing him up. And one that showed a man dropping something with an X. All of them had the word NO done up in big black letters so as you couldn't make no mistake. First, I thought them Canadians also done something to the wild gooses and ducks sitting in the water so as they don't tear away once you come near them the way they, the down-home birds do. I figured they must have tied the bird's legs to something underwater to hold them in place. But when I got too close to one of them big gainers come ripping at me out of the water and give me a right proper bite that drawed blood on my leg, which got the captain laughing. I was surprised that all them sitting in one spot ducks and gooses hadn't been took home and cooked. If they was in possum moan, all that would be left of them would be a feather or two floating on the water and a couple of sets of footprints in the mud showing how far a, a duck got afore he was snatched up by a barefoot boy. But maybe these Canadians was doing something right with this idea about parks because it sure was soothish and common to sit there and wait. We heard a group of the young people afore we seen them. The captain checked his watch and said, You gotta love the folk up north. Even the darkies is always on time. Sure enough, it was a bunch of students all dressed up from head to toe, both colored and white. They was chatting and running and jumping around with no cares at all. Once they was about 25, 30 yards from us, I spotted the one who had to be Sylvanus. My jaw dropped when I seen how big he was. I started wondering right off if he was even bigger than me. I ain't sure why it was such a surprise. If I'd have been paying proper attention, I would have known that this Sylvanus boy was going to be big for his age. I mean, his pa was pert near close to pap size, and his ma wasn't no shrinking violet of a woman, neither. She was the kind of person you wouldn't want to fight unless you was carrying a good-sized stick. There must have been eight darky boys amongst a group of students that come walking toward the pond. I was about as sure as, I, as can be that the big one was Sylvanus, not just because of his size, because he was, even though everybody knows it's kind of tricky telling one darky from the next, the boy who was a whole head taller than every other student, the one you might have picked out for being the teacher if he wasn't, oh, if he wasn't wearing the exact same clothes as the other students, and was the one who favored Lou, the woman who was cooling her heels at the Detroit jail. If you'd have put a smock on him and shrunk him down about eight or nine sizes, they was one and the same. The captain said, I'm thinking it's that one walking by himself there. Why, no, sir, he's the big one. He looked the same as his ma. The captain's eyes rolled. Oh, so you're telling me you can tell one darky from another, ones you just met? Why, look at him, sir. There ain't no doubt. I couldn't believe the captain didn't see it. There was something else the captain wasn't seeing about Sylvanus neither. And even though the boy was a thief, it had me feeling right sorry and sympathetic for him. Ma had been poking fun at me once when we was walking home because she said all I'd done that day from when we got to the fields at sunrise to when we left at dusk was ask questions or make comments about Julie Jones. Why, Charlie Bobo, Ma had said, I ain't heard you mention old Stanky one time today. That dog's going to be right jealous you dumped her so easy for something as plain and homely as that skinny, knock-kneed foster girl. You don't forget there's anything else in the world except for her? She was right. All I could do was blush, and Ma laughed. Don't you worry none, Charlie. I felt the same way about your pa the first time I seen him cutting trees. I was sure enough smited. And once you get smited, ain't nothing you can do about it but hang on for the ride. 
Poor old Savannah got himself smited bad. And judging by the way he was skinning and grinning and frolicking around this one color girl, he wasn't holding on for the ride. He was getting dragged by foot first by anything the girl done. For the first time since I started getting big, I could see why the captain and Ma would say it ain't becoming for no one big as me to act the way I do sometimes. Because when you see someone as growed looking as Sylvanus Demarest spooning and mooning over this color gal, it sure didn't look normal. Sure made you take a closer look. Captain said, we ain't going to do nothing till tomorrow, but I sure hope you's wrong. It ain't going to be no picnic getting control of that giant darky. Then proving me right, as soon as a group of students passed by me in the captain's bench, the colored girl slapped at the big boy's arm and said, Oh, Seal, you are such a tease. The captain looked at me and swore. The way Sylvanus's face took a glowing and the smile he gave showed this colored girl could have walked headlong into the middle of a lake and he'd have sure enough followed. If there wasn't but one drop of human blood in your veins, you couldn't help but feel sorry for the poor sap. We was probably doing him a favor getting him out of this terrible situation. We waited for two more days watching the group of students come and eat and play and have fun with each other. I'd been having such a good time that I was right disappointed when at the end of the second day sne of sneaking looks at Sylvanus, the captain said, we do it tomorrow. We'd noticed that after all the other students would leave, Sylvanus and the color girl stayed and sat on the bench looking through books. Then after a half hour, the girl would leave and he'd stay another half hour with his nose in a book before he took off. Everything depends on the timing, the captain told me that night right after the Bible reading. If you do just what I told you, we can rush the boy out the park right onto the train and have him in Windsor before his head stops spinning. It ain't no different than running a con. You gotta pay to, you gotta get your mark off balance and keep him that way till it's too late for him to do anything, except and say, oops. The next day we got to the park at a quarter to 12 and went to our regular bench. At exactly 10 minutes after noon, the voices of the students was heard and my stomach started tensing up. They hadn't paid us uh, one whit attention from day one, but to be on the safe side, the captain buried his face in a newspaper and I kept pretending I was looking at them peculiar behaving ducks. Sylvanus and the, other, and the color girl was laughing and enjoying one another's company, and I slid my eyes over to him, and something all of a sudden hit me and made me want to cry. It didn't take but a second for me to see that what was grabbing hold to me was what Ma used to call the green eye monster. Much as a surprise as it was to me, I started, get to, started to get teary-eyed because I was jealous of a darkie. I couldn't help but think, how's this fair? How's it fair that these folk, who was right around my age, spent their days reading out of books and laughing and joking and whispering in each other's ears, whilst all I'd done in possum moments have my face looking at the backside of a mule or pulling weeds and working from sunrise to sunset? How's it fair that they is walking around these fancy uniforms with clean shoes and looking all neat whilst I most times in, uh, barefoot in rags? Ma was right. These darkies was living better than white folk. The captain looked at his pocket watch and said, Wouldn't you know it? She ain't leaving when she's supposed to. I looked over at Sylvanus and the girl, and they was both so stuck in their books, they must have forgot everything else. Didn't but a half second go by before captain looked at his watch again and said, If she ain't out of here in a minute, we won't make the train, and we stuck here till next Tuesday. Something told me I should have brought these, shouldn't have bought these tickets. The captain started cursing his luck, but I'd, I'd been told not to do it, but I decided to do something off the top of my head. Besides, I wanted to see this girl up close. I walked over and rested myself on the bench right next to the girl and Sylvanus. They were so stuck on them books that they didn't even take no notice that I was there. I could understand why Sylvanus was so thunderstruck by the girl. She was sort of pretty. I cleared my throat and said, Excuse me, do y'all know what time it is? They both turned their heads up from the books. She looked at a watch on her arm and said, Oh no, Syl, I'm late. It's five minutes after one, sir. She got up and they shook hands. Hurry along, I shall see you tomorrow, Michelle. He wouldn't let go of her hand and she laughed. She said, Syl. She looked at me and said, excuse me. She ran off back in the direction they come from. 
Sylvanus gave me a smile, then put his head back in his book. I said, excuse me again, but ain't you Sylvanus Demarest? His mouth fouled open and he said, pardon me? And this is where we'll stop.